All right, we're rolling. Welcome to the first talk in the GPU computing series um, in this uh, stats department at Iowa State. I'm Will Landau, I'm a third year, and I'm gonna talk to you about GPU computing for statisticians. Now, a bunch of you are in other departments. It's great. Um, I'm coming from the point of view of a statistician, so if you would bear me with me, that would be, that would be great. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about GPUs and parallelism in general. There's a specific architecture of, GPU, of GPUs called CUDA. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as well. And I'm gonna talk about the resources that the stat department has, which you guys from other departments, if you talk to the IT guys, you'll be able to um, use as well. And there are some resources with GPU computing in R that I'm also gonna talk about as well. Um, so there's this thing called the single instruction multiple data paradigm, where you take a single function or single set of code and you just apply it to, to different parts of data over and over and over again. Now usually this is done sequentially. Um, for example, you have a for loop. This is an R syntax, by the way. Um, so I just take a vector A of a million elements, a vector B of a million elements, and a vector C of a million elements, and I add the corresponding entries of A and B, store them in C, and uh, sorry, B and C, store them in A. Now I do that a million times, and one step happens after every every previous step. So each loop iteration happen, all the loop iterations happen sequentially. So this loop is really long. What if we could do all these loop iterations at the same time? That'd be pretty neat, wouldn't it? So the sequential stuff is what happens on CPUs, but on GPUs, we can run all million iterations at the same time. So we can have something like i equals thread idx dot x. I'll tell you what that means later. And this is just pseudocode in our syntax, by the way. Um, and, and for each i, you have a sub i is b sub i plus c sub i, but since I have a million of these, what are called threads, instances of your program acting simultaneously. Each one takes a single loop iteration. The upshot is that you can do all iterations at the same time. And that's the sort of thing you would do. You would take all of these threads, have them do the same instruction set, but in different places in your data set. And we can similarly parallelize more than just loops. By parallelize, I mean um, spawn several instances of your program, threads, and have them all act in simultaneously, in parallel. That's what I mean by parallelism. So there's this paper by Li Yao and Giles. It's in the references section at the end. And they were doing a parallelized MCMC, where they took each chain and assign each instance of their MCMC to, you know, oh, what I wanna say is that they assigned um, each parallel thread, each instance of their program to a single chain. So they're running multiple chains simultaneously. So here they had eight chains running at once, 32 chains running at once, and so on. Mar uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo is MCMC. MCM, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo is a statistical method that, or set of methods to sample from a uh, probability distribution. Typically multivariate probability distribution that's very difficult to sample from. And so what these guys did is they ran their algorithm, an equivalent sequential algorithm on a CPU and they also ran this parallelized algorithm using a particular kind of GPU. This, this GTX is a, model, uh, is a uh, model of a GPU. By the way, GPU stands for Graphics Processing Unit. I'll explain a little bit more about what that means later. But the point for now is if you take the ratio of CPU time to GPU time, that ratio goes way up as the number of chains goes up. Now this ratio, ratio CPU time to GPU time is called the speed up. And 
we get a speed up eventually. If the number of chains increases really high, then we get about a more than 200-fold speed up, almost 300-fold speed up. And this is a lot more of a speed up than you would get if you were running a state-of-the-art sequential algorithm. These are speed ups that you don't see practically anywhere else. This is very, very high, and it makes a huge practical difference. So how many chains could we do in an algorithm with the number of cores? How many, how many cores? Yeah. I don't know off the top of my head. I'm not familiar with the GTX. I only actually know about the Teslas that we have um, on our servers, which have about, they have 448 cores. I don't know what model this one has, but you can certainly look it up. It's the GTX 280. Okay. Okay. So it was commented that GTX is probably about the same, for those of you online, um, is about the same as the Tesla with some minor memory differences. And um, so, yeah, if GTX is anything like the Teslas that we have, then you would expect them to have 448 cores, but I don't know the, the exact number. Is it like 240 cores? 240 cores for the GTX? Thanks. Okay. So, same guys did a sequential Monte Carlo, and they got a similar speed up, except they were they weren't parallelizing this time across a number of chains. They didn't have multiple chains running simultaneously. They had um, the algorithm work on different parts of the data in parallel. So as the sample size goes up then you start, to see, you start to see more and more of a speed up. We actually get a pretty good speed up even at their starting sample size. Admittedly, it was already 8,000. So um, in any case, you still get a 200-fold speed up here. It's another example. And this one's a paper by Suchard. Wang and Chen. It's another paper that I you can find in the references section. They explain their methods and how they introduce parallelism into Bayesian expectation maximization. And they parallelize across the data too. So as sample size goes up, the speed up gets just just over 100. Again, very good results that you don't see typically with other programming paradigms. So. Other applications, there are a lot of applications. Clustering, you're going to see a really um, uh, simple two-dimensional k-means example later on. Um, I, it was a little thing that I wrote in the spring just for pedagogical purposes. But there's some very, some very sophisticated clustering algorithms out there that are parallelized and are much, much faster than their sequential counterparts. Because you have each individual point, right? And you want to assign each individual point into a cluster. And rather than working, looping through those points and reassigning them to clusters in sequence, you can just assign them all at once. You can, you can have several instances of your programming, of your program, run at the exact same time. And each instance of your program that runs in parallel is responsible for one single point. And so it all gets done at once. So bootstrap is another, in part because generating random numbers, if you need a lot of random numbers generated, you can do that in parallel as well. And there's a library, um, NVIDIA, who makes um, graphics cards, also makes software for GPUs. And one of their libraries is called QRAND. And it helps you generate random numbers in parallel. It's very fast and very good. Regression, too. Anything with linear algebra is, can be parallelized. And there's another library that does this very well, too. There's, if any of you are familiar with BLOSS or LAPAC, there are parallel implementations of those. They're called KUBLOSS and KULA. And they help you do things like regression, because all regression is is matrix algebra, um, typically, if you're talking about ordinary least squares. Um, for other maximum likelihood stuff um, that 
for that and, and more complicated regressions, generalized linear models, and stuff like that. Um, you're going to do things a little bit differently sometimes, um, but it's yeah. Anything with matrix algebra like regression, you can parallelize and get a huge speed up from. Like I said, matrix algebra in general, EM algorithm. You already saw that the Bayesian EM was, I mean, was successfully parallelized. Rejection sampling, believe it or not, you usually think of rejection sampling as sequential. You know, you loop through, you you iterate the algorithm until some condition holds, and then you stop, right? But rejection sampling usually means generating a lot of random numbers, and that can be that part of the program can be parallelized. Also, if you're doing rejection sampling. If you're doing a multivariate rejection sampling, you can sort of parallelize across the number of variables that you have and speed up each each sort of each iteration of the rejection sampler too. So even though it's not obvious, there are ways to parallelize rejection sampling. Um, multiple testing. If you have several thousand tests that you want to do, several thousand hypothesis tests in the tens of thousands of hypothesis tests, maybe you don't want to loop through and test each one individually in sequence. Maybe you want to do them all at once in parallel. That's another one, uh, application. Um, cross-validation is another one. So usually in cross-validation, you divide your, your data set into a training set and a testing set, right? And you compare what you get in the training and the testing, right? But really sophisticated cross-validation methods you know, loop through all possible partitions of your data, right? It's sort of um, k-fold. That's that's what's meant by k-fold cross-validation. And so, each part for each partition of the cross-validation, you can assign that to a parallel instance of your program, and then all those partitions, all of those those cross-validations for each uh, partition of your data can all get done at once in parallel. And there are tons more applications. And my goal is to teach you how to write the software to do any and all of these that you want. Believe it or not, there's a lot of applications of parallel programming and GPU uh, computing. Not a whole lot has been done. And a lot of this code you're going you're gonna to be writing yourself. And my goal is to teach you how to do that. So, but to do that, we need to talk about the hardware. Because an understanding of the hardware will help you optimize your code. Now. So basics on computer processors. A processing unit is a computer chip that performs executive functions. So that's a, when, when somebody says processor, processor or processing unit or CPU, they usually all mean the same thing. So a core is one of many subprocessors on the same processing chip. It used to be that a core and a processor were the same thing, but it turns out that you know, in the when parallel computing was just starting out, you just you had um, two processors very close together on the same chip, and those are actually cores. And then the big the bigger processors were actually the the collection of those cores. So processing units are subdivided into cores, each of which is sort of sort of contributes to the executive functioning of the computer. So CPU called a central processing unit. It's just your regular computer processor. And you can do par things in parallel on CPUs, but you can't do massive parallelism, you know, parallelism on the kind of scale that we're talking about for GPU computing. Um, CPUs, part of their limitation is they only have one to eight cores. I think the number of cores these days goes up to eight. Maybe in the future it'll go up to 12 or 16 or something. Um, I've only heard of eight, up to eight, personally. Um, here's some examples you might be familiar with. There is the Intel 8086, which is based off the x86 architecture. I'm sure a lot of you heard of x86. Even more of you might have heard of Intel Core 2 Duo. A lot of Macs have that. It's a very common, very successful kind of CPU that's out there. And here's a picture. It's just a, a processing chip, and you'll find it on the motherboard of of every computer. 
The GPU, on the other hand, is a graphics processing unit. And it's not a replacement for a CPU because it's a processor on a video card or graphics card. Believe it or not, graphics cards have their own processors. And they can do massively parallel calculations. And they're originally designed for really high throughput in um, displays on earlier versions of Windows and in things like video games. And like I said, it's not a replacement for a CPU. It can't run by itself. To run a, a GPU, you need to be hooked up with, to a computer with a CPU. Great thing about it, one of the reasons it can, it, we can do massively parallel calculations on it is it has several hundred cores. Now, the more cores a processor has, usually, the, the more parallel instances of your program you can, you can create and the more you get done in parallel steps of your code. It also has higher memory bandwidth than the CPU, meaning the cores can communicate quicker with on-chip memory than in a CPU. So here's some examples. There's the GE4600. Uh, um, there is the GTX. Another GTX model is featured in one of the papers I mentioned previously. And then there's the Teslas. Now, that we have Teslas on you know, our stat department, GPU accelerated Linux machines. And here's some pictures. You might be familiar with a picture like this. This is a graphics card that you might buy and install inside of your computer. Um, here's what one of the chips look like, looks like. So here's a diagram of sort of what you can expect about when it comes to memory transfer and um, ability to parallelize. So you have a CPU over here. I call it the host down below because I'll refer to CPU as the host and the GPU as the device a lot. That's just general lingo. Um, but in any, in any case, this is a diagram of the CPU. Here's a GPU hooked up to the same computer. You can see the number of cores on each, um, roughly. I mean, I can't put all 400 cores here and have uh, the picture still be readable. Um, this CPU has eight cores. This GPU has, does it have four times eight? 32, 32 cores, which is very low for a GPU. But anyway, so a couple differences, a couple things you can see. How you, these lines that you see uh, mean very important things. So for example, this, this, um, this line, is, represents the connection between the cores and the on-chip memory. So this line is really thin here, and the analogous line over here for, this, for the GPU is very thick, which means there's a lot higher bandwidth between on-chip memory and GPU cores on a graphics processing unit than on a CPU. So communication, reading and writing to on-chip memory is a lot faster on a GPU than on a CPU. That's what this diagram says with this thick line here and this thinner line here. Another thing to, that you notice that's very important when you're doing GPU computing is this line from the GPU to the, C, to, from the CPU to the GPU. So that means that communication between the CPU and the GPU is very slow. There's very low bandwidth between the two. So you want to read from the GPU and write to the GPU as little as possible because there's a lot of overhead and slows your program down. Once your data's on the GPU, then you're, you're golden, you're set. You can run things really, really fast. So the benefits of writing to the graphics card better outweigh the, that overhead if you're gonna do parallel computing. But if it does outweigh the uh, costs, then you're gonna get a really high speed up once, once your data is actually loaded. And the roles of CPU and GPU are like this. So imagine you're, you're doing a math problem, right? And you're doing, some, you're doing some applied calculus, let's say, and you come to a place where you need to do a lot of, you've, you've done the algebra, you've done the derivatives, you've done, or integrals, or whatever you're doing, and you get to this point where you need to do a lot of arithmetic. And you're thinking, I don't want to do this arithmetic. You know, that's what a computer can do. And I, I pull out my pocket calculator and type stuff in and 
I get, I get an answer. You know, it's this, it's this menial number crunching that I don't want to do, but the high level thinking I take care of. The, the CPU GPU relationship is kind of like that. The, the CPU does the executive functions, sort of the high level, high level thinking, and then when you get to mind-numbingly dumb tasks that, c that need to be done over and over and over again on different parts of the data, the CPU says, well, I don't want to bother with this stuff. I'm going to send my data to the, to the GPU and let the GPU take care of that. They, I, can, I have all these minions, all of these cores that I can use to my advantage. And once they're done laboring away, they send back to me the results and I can look at them. So that's how you want to think about it when you're, when you're writing parallel code in the future. So like I said, I want to clarify some things. Parallelism is the practice of running multiple calculations simultaneously. And the architecture of GPUs is extremely well suited to massively parallel workflows. And that should have been evident from the diagram before. You had a lot of cores. They could all run simultaneously. And in addition, very, very high memory bandwidth to on-chip memory. So, but there are other kinds of parallelism. So this GPU stuff is particular to this architecture. And there are a lot of other kinds of parallelism. There's strictly CPU parallelism, and most people do that with things called POSIX threads. Does anyone, does uh, pthread create ring a bell for anyone? Anyone done POSIX threads? It's very hard. It's a lot harder than, than, than GPU computing. When I, I learned POSIX, or I tried to learn POSIX threads as an undergrad in a computer science class, never got the hang of it. I thought this GPU computing stuff, when I started, it was going to be really hard. And it's actually not nearly as hard. Um, if you have a good background in C, then this will be very natural. There's also parallel cloud computing. Cloud computing is to computer science is kind of like big data to st statistics. Well, big data is also in computer science. But anyway, it's another next big thing out there. Um, I don't know much about it, but apparently there's a parallelism paradigm in the context of cloud computing. Um, there's also OpenMP. It's been around, f around for a while. I don't know anything about it, but it's an alternative. And then, whoops, I say OpenMP twice. I didn't mean to do that. I, what I meant to do is say OpenCL. So OpenCL is, CL stands for common language. There's this OpenCL paradigm that says, well, we want to take C code, and we want to help people do parallel computing in that language without worrying about any architecture. You know, you can load it on a, on a GPU or another kind of, of massively parallel processor or architecture and just parallelize things without worrying about what kind of hardware you have. And that's, that's really the idea behind OpenCL. It's very new, but apparently very good. So for GPU parallelism in particular, this is what kind of speed up you can expect. So um, if you want to know how much speed up you can theoretically get, you'll look at Amdahl's law. And, and um, Amdahl's quantity, which is this, gives you the maximum, maximum theoretical speed up across cores. So, that's, so this is uh, CPU execution time divided by GPU execution time. P is the fraction of, of the programs uh, of the program that can be parallelized. And this fraction is in terms of execution time, the fraction of execution time that can be parallelized. And n is the number of processors. So if we take, if we have a lot of cores, as n goes to infinity, Amdahl's quantity goes to this. Which means, for example, if 99% of the program can be parallelized across cores, then we could have a 100-fold speed up. And that's the sort of thing that we saw in previous examples. Um, the thing with Amdahl's law, though, is it only talks about parallelism across cores. Each core can also multitask, which means you might even, if you just have a really efficient machine, and you could imagine that just parallelism across cores gets exactly 
gets you to exactly this level of speed up, you might even be able to make things run faster because each core can multitask. I mean, imagine you know, your, your processor multitasks all the time, your, your CPU. That's why you can run Word and run Excel, for example, at the same time. You know, your computer multitasks. And it's, it's you know, very natural for, you know, people to multitask. So, for example, if you're, if, you're, if you're making dinner for people and you're cooking soup and you're baking bread, I'm going to mix the bread dough up, but I'm not just going to sit there and stare at the bread waiting for it to rise. While the bread's rising, I'm going to go chop up vegetables, right, for the soup. The, com your, your, the computer, the cores do exactly the same thing. While, while the core is waiting for data to be written or, or wrote, um, written or, or read from sort of some distant memory location, it goes off and do something else. And when the data comes in the mail, then it goes back up, back to what it was doing previously. So, and that can, that, you can get speed ups from that. So, um, be aware of that as well. You're not limited by the number of cores. So, a little bit more about how GPU parallelism works, a little bit more lingo. Um, the, GPU, the CPU sends a command called a kernel to the CPU. A kernel is an instruction set that's meant to be executed multiple times over the data. I'm mean, going to use the word kernel a lot. So, the kernel is executed multiple times. Those separate, du those duplicate um, executions are called threads. So these threads that I've been talking about, which I have in the slides now, are separate instances of your program, separate parallel instances of your program that are run on the GPU. And for convenience and very practical reasons, which I will get to in detail in later days, these threads are grouped together in bunches called blocks. It's very, com very easy for threads within each block to communicate among themselves. And communication across blocks is different. Um, that's is, is, is more difficult. That's one of the reasons we, we group threads into blocks. Um, and there's all sorts of memory issues as well with threads and blocks. Um, blocks get their own sets, their own private sets of memory as well. It's very convenient to group threads into blocks. So that's what we do. And the sum of all total threads in, this, in the kernel is called a grid. So you have a whole grid of threads, and this grid is divided into blocks. Um, so here's, here's how something like this might, might carry out in practice, and hopefully will help you understand what I mean. So here's a toy example. So the CPU is about, it sends a kernel to the, to the GPU, and the kernel is some pairs of adjacent numbers. And use this array, the numbers 1 through 8, and do that with two blocks of two threads each. So here's what's going to happen. So the GPU thinks that's the kernel, and this is the data, and it's given how to parallelize that calculation with the numbers of blocks and threads. And what it does is it executes four sums in parallel. So in block 0, thread 0 computes 1 plus 2. Block 0, thread 1, thread, that thread computes 3 plus 4, and so on. And the last part of that array gets summed up in the threads in that block number 1, that second block. So I divide up the tasks among these threads, and these threads I'll execute at the same time. And that's the sort of thing I'm, I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to think about uh, parallel algorithms when I, when I go to write my code. So on all, and just a reminder, threads all happen simultaneously. So all four of these sums, these actions, happen simultaneously. And there are multiple ways to parallelize this. So I could have had just one block with four threads if I wanted to. I could have four blocks with one thread each. Because in all those situations, I, I still have four sums. And it's, it can be tricky to, to decide how many blocks and how many threads you need. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. But it, there's, there's, um, uh, there's 
for, for reasons that I'm not going to get to yet, it's good to have um, thread the number of threads as a multiple of 32. Um, that's not obvious by any structure of the imagination, but I will tell you why in a bit uh, in a later at a later date. Um, in the ratio of blocks to threads, and the maximum number of blocks, and the maximum number of threads are al also things that you're going to want to consider in practice. So here's a diagram for you. So kernels happen sequentially. So each grid happens sequentially. Everything in each grid happens simultaneously. So you have each grid, and they're divided into blocks. And each block is divided into a bunch of threads. Now, I show these blocks and these threads in, uh, these threads in two dimensions, because if you want to, you can give them indices in two and three dimensions. This comes from GPUs, are, and the way you program GPUs is heavily it's still heavily based in graphics, because um, it came from graphics stuff. Um, and so you can think of a grid as sort of a bitmap, as sort of you know what you would see as you're as you're you know playing a game or or just just using the operating system for other purposes. And blocks would be different parts of the screen, and be thread threads would be sort of different locations at that block, maybe maybe tiny sets of pixels or something. So a bit about CUDA. So I talked about GPUs in general. And CUDA is a particular class of, it's, it's a particular architecture and a particular class of GPUs. So like I said, GPUs are originally meant to speed up video games and graphics displays. And Games like Duke Nukem 3D really sped up the development of GPUs. This should bring back some memories for some people. Um, I'm a retro gamer, but usually not that retro. So the trouble is, I mean, scientists were looking at GPUs and say, saying, wow, maybe we could use this, this architecture to speed up our data analysis. Trouble is, they had to program in graphical languages. And it's really hard to take a scientific problem and sort of force it into this graphics framework. I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really hard to, to port to that. But, but scientists are used to things like Fortran and C and other languages, other general purpose languages. And people thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to be able to program on a general, in a general purpose language on a GPU? And that's exactly what CUDA does. So CUDA stands for Compute Unified Device Architecture. Unified meaning un it unifies you know, some of the CPU functionality with the GPU. And it's meant for general purpose computing. And there is uh, a language called CUDA C, really CUDA C slash C++, because it has a lot of C++ functionality as well. That you use to program on CUDA processors. And it's very nice because, if you, like I said, if you have a good background in C, if you know about dynamic memory and pointers and all of that, then this will be very natural. We have CUDA-enabled servers. Now, if you don't have an account on our Linux servers for you guys in other departments, you can go talk to the IT guys. They're Right over there, I know you can't see where I'm pointing, those, those of you online. Um, there, you just, you just go out of this room, Snedeker two, uh, 2113, take a right, the end of the hall, our IT guys, they're great, they can help you out, they can set you up. Um, these servers are impact one through four. Some are Red Hat, some are CentOS. Used to be all Red Hat, at least for, for impact one, that was, um, the only one we had for a while, and then Impact 2, 3, and 4 have been added on. Um, currently, Impact 1 actually is the only one that, that was working last week, at least. I don't know if they've, if they've fixed the, the GPU functionality for the others, but um, if, you're, if, you're writing, if you're already writing code in CUDA C and want to test things out, I would use Impact 1 for now. Um, last I checked, Impact 2 and 4 didn't have their GPUs hooked up. There there have been a lot of technical difficulties recently. Um, they don't have graphical user interfaces, so if you're logging in, 
use the Linux command line. Um, each of them is 24 CPUs. So if you like CPU parallelism, this is a gold mine as well. Um, I was running calculations for my master's project for a while on the impact servers because our other Linux servers have eight cores, which is great, but I mean, I, I wanted to use more CPU cores for that. Um, I couldn't use GPUs because I had to use existing software for my master's project because I was doing a comparison of methods. Um, so I was limited to, to CPU computing, and I just parallelized across these, across some of these 24 cores um, using the multi-core package in R. Anyway, each of them has four GPUs. They're all Teslas. And each of those Teslas has 448 cores. And for more specs, you can log into impact one, two, or three. And you can shell into this directory the NVIDIA GPU Computing SDK. That's the software development kit that comes with an installation of CUDA. Um, CUDA is also a software package that comes along with the, with the CUDA hardware. So any installation with CUDA, it comes with a, with a software development kit. And there's example code there, which you can try to run. There's diagnostics for hardware. There's all sorts of neat stuff that you can go to and check out. Um, for those of you online, I'm just going to demonstrate how to log in. Because there are a lot of people out there who, who aren't familiar with um, command line interfaces anymore. And so I'm just going to show you that real quick. So what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the terminal in Mac um, for people who are using Linux, you should know about the terminal because Linux is really, that's, I mean, Linux without the terminal is, is, is like a car without wheels. You know, it's just, um, anyway. So, but if you're using Windows, by the way, and want to use the command line, I would, I would um, install something like Sigwin or MinGW. I'm just going to show that to you real quick. Come on, Firefox. Oh, well, it'll take a while to load. So anyway, I'm going to show you how to log in. Whoops. Nope, maybe I'll show you where Sigwin is. So for you Windows users out there, go to sigwin.com. And this is what you, you should see. So Sigwin is a, a, is a program that helps Windows machines act like Linux machines. Basically, you get a command line interface for your Windows machine, and you can browse it as if it were a Linux machine. And use, you can use, you get Linux functionality out of Windows machine. Um, on Ubuntu on Windows, you say? Yeah. yeah, you can. You can install Ubuntu on Windows, too. That's, um, and you can install any, any Linux, as far as I know, any Linux, uh, um, distro on Windows. Problem is, not a lot of people want to people change operating system. Yeah, if you still want to, you, can log in the you mean in a virtual machine? No, in an actual machine. Oh, okay. You can index the whole thing as an instance on your laptop, and then you know, okay, yeah. Yeah. You see, are you saying that that Windows can have two different operating systems? No. Okay. Yeah. I see. So you can load, you can you can install Linux on top of Windows and then log out of Windows and log into Linux. That's pretty nice. I didn't know about that. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think Sigwin might be convenient for people who don't need to log out, but who don't want to log out. But do you have access to the same file system um, when you log out? So you do have access to the same file system if you log out of your Windows no, copy and then. You can. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, that's really neat to know. For those of you who are watching the screencast online, there's a way to install Ubuntu on a Windows machine and not have to partition your hard drive or delete your copy of Windows, which is really nice. Um, but anyway, for those of you who want to stay working in Windows, SigWin is great. Um, you can you have the same Linux functionality, Linux command line functionality on the Windows machine. That's great. For those of you who are running Macs, like I am, go to Utilities and open your terminal. Do you, do you see this thing called terminal.app? Open that. And this window is my terminal. I'm going to make this text big for you. So one thing to note, if you have in your home directory, there should be a file called .bash rc. And to make logging into impact one really easy, you can use an alias. So I have an alias to log into impact one. That's this line right here. It's all one line, believe it or not. I just made the text really big. Let me fit that all in one line. There you go. So what I want to do is SSH into Linux. I can I've, I set up my alias so that um, I just have to type in the letter I and hit enter, and I log in. But for everybody else who doesn't want to maybe modify your bash RC, you would SSH or secure shell into impact one. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And it takes a long, it takes a while to log on. And there's this k renew or k init thing that has to do with access to your sci files. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to bother with that. I never use sci files. Um, point is, now you're on impact one, and you can do. Oh, by the way, the impact machines are hooked up to port 323. For other machines, the port might be different. That's why that dash p flag is here. Um, the syntax is just, by the way, SSH, your ISU ID, and then at impact1.stat.istate.edu. Talk to the IT guys if you want to, if you can't log on, you may not have an account with, with um, the uh, our, our Linux system yet. And what else? I want to run device query so I know <coughs> what specs I have. So I'm going to shell or CD into user local NVIDIA SDK C bin Linux release. And I'm there. And I hit dot slash device query. And it'll output all sorts of information uh, about the graphics cards that are hooked up. So it should find it found it should have found four cards. They're indexed from zero to three. And it gives you they give you all kinds of information. Um, so here's a spec for specs for device two. It tells you it's a Tesla. It tells you the version of CUDA. We're trying to upgrade to five, um, currently at four. Uh, there's this thing called compute capability, which you'll want to know when you're about when you're writing code. You get the number of cores. It's 448. You can you get all sorts of specs about the hardware. Anything you're wondering about, you can about the hardware. You can um, you can look up here. Maximum dimensions of each grid, that's the number of blocks that you can spawn in, in each dimension. So you get about 60,000 blocks in each, each dimension. Of, and in the x and y dimensions for each block, you get about 1,000 threads. So you can have a lot of threads. You can have uh, millions of, of threads if you want to. You only get 100 cores, though, and that's going to limit you a bit in practice. I, I, before I said that the number of cores doesn't limit you, 
Um, but I mean, it does, but not not strictly. So I already explained how to log on. It's there in the slides. And if you don't know about the command line, you can go to this URL or you can contact me or stat IT. You can, like I said, you can contact stat IT if you can't log on. You want shortcuts to log on without having to enter your password or you want to shorten um, your SSH command. So important to directories are the following. So there's your, your home directory, home slash ISUID. That's your private folder on our all of our Linux servers, our SMB system. And that's stored remotely. That's not stored locally on Impact One. So if you have a, a huge file of data, then you're not probably not going to want to store that here if you need to read and write it really fast from the CPU side, at least, because that's not actually stored on impact one or two or three or four. Um, you have a sci files folder, and that's even slower than the SMB in terms of communication. You have the temp fo uh, folder, and everything here is stored locally on whatever machine you're on. So that's where you might want to store data. Keep in mind, though, that the temp folder empties about every two weeks or so. So you don't want to keep really important things on there. Um, and then there is the software development kit from NVIDIA. That is exam is, it has example code. And that's stored locally on whatever machine you're on. And you don't have write privileges here, so you have to copy, comp you have to copy code to the folders that you can control in order to compile it. Um, you can run the binaries there, though. Really quickly, GPU computing in R. I don't have much time, but um, all the slides are there, and I also talked about this in the condensed short course. So there are a bunch of R packages for GPU computing in R. Actually, there are not very many relative to you know, the opportunities for parallelism that are out there. There's uh, these four, and then there's the one I like, which is GPU tools. It's a machine learning package that also has some general purpose functionality to it. So you can choose which there are, I'm just gonna go through some functions in it. You can choose or set your GPU ID. You can, con that means you can control which graphics card you can, you're, you're actually using if you have multiple graphics cards. There are a bunch of functions for linear algebra, matrix multiplication, Euclidean distance, cross product, QR, and SVD factor, uh, factorizations, um, solving systems of linear equations. There's equivalent functions for LM and GLM, which is really cool. If you know the, every, everyone knows, or a lot of people know, the LM command and the GLM command in R. GPU tools gives you parallel implementations of LM and GLM. So that's something you can use right now for, for a lot of analyses. There's hypothesis testing. There's, and then there's a bunch of machine learning functions right here, clustering and, and uh, uh, sub, uh, support vector machines and all that kind of stuff. So I have some example code, don't have time to go through it, but it just demonstrates that matrix multiplication on the GPU is much faster. So here's a GPU matrix multiplication here um, in GPU tools, it takes about three seconds. The equivalent CPU matrix multiplication in R takes um, more than, well, almost 50 times longer than it did in the GPU version, in the CPU version, rather, because the matrices are very big. They have uh, 10 million entries each. Um, a couple of years ago, I did a, well, a year ago, I did a comparison of GLM versus GPU LM, and I increased the number of observations, and I saw, you know, I, I tried to measure the speed up as you increase the number of observations. Now you can't see the, the green line very well, but that's the GPU, that's the runtime on the, on the GPU version, the, the GPU GLM. The blue is the CPU runtime. And as you go to um, 10 to the five, this is 10 to the five observations. As you go past 10 to the five observations, you start to see more and more of a speed up here. You need really big data in order to see speed up. But if you 
but if you do have a lot of big data, then, then um, this is to your advantage. There's also, um, on the GPU Tools' website, you'll see um, a bit about their Granger causality test. Granger causality test is a, is a hypothesis test that tests um, whether one time series is useful in predicting another. And as you see, as the number of random variables increases, they get, you do see more and more of a speed up. All right. So uh, I know I have, well, I'm over time, but just real quick, how the, the breakdowns of the, of the talks is going to be as follows. Intro and GPU tools, that's today. Next time, I'm going to talk about a codeless introduction to GPU parallelism. So I'm going to take specific algorithms, a lot of examples, and I'm going to show you how to break them down in parallel in, pre in preparation to, uh, for, the, for, the, for implementation on the GPU. I'm going to introduce CUDA C the next time. Once you understand sort of how I would think about parallelizing code, I'm going to actually write some stuff or show you stuff that's already written in CUDA C. Then I'm going to jump right into some examples that statisticians like. There's k-means and there's uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo from um, one of my classes. Um, Zeb here and I took stat 544. Um, so did uh, some more of us. So did Sam. And Jeff, were you in that class, 544? No? It was a great class. It was a really good class. And uh, um, there was one example about a bladder cancer data set in MCMC. And I'm going to go through that. Zeb wrote um, a, parallel MC, a parallel sampler that I'm going to present. I actually modified it a bit. He'll recognize the modifications. Um, but I'm going to present that. And then I get into more advanced stuff. So there's. Um, Managing shared memory. Remember I said blocks get, get their own private memory. That's shared memory. And measuring the performance of code that you write for the GPU. Then race conditions, atomics, and warps, even more advanced. Race conditions and atomics usually happen in CPU parallelism. That's part of the reason CPU parallelism is so hard, is because of race conditions. It don't appear as much in the GPU, but it's worth knowing about. Then I get into libraries that, that you can uh, use from NVIDIA. So NVIDIA has linear algebra libraries, Kublas and Kula. I'm going to go over those. Anything with matrices, you'll want to know about that. Generating random numbers, there's an entire library for that, for, generating, for accelerated generation of random numbers. It's called Kuran. Really nice. And then Thrust, one of my favorites. It's the, it's the how many of you know of STL, Standard Template Library, C++? A little bit. This is an extension of, this is a GPU accelerated version of um, the STL. And not only that, it has a lot more, it has a lot of GPU accelerated algorithms um, that I believe the uh, STL does not have. And I use this all the time in code. Now, after that, I'm going to have an intro lecture on Python. And you may say, well, why am, why am I going over Python? Well, it's, it's in preparation for a, a special module called PyCUDA, where you can write um, kernels in Python and work mostly in Python. Work with your data in Python and then write kernels for, the, for CUDA C and just work and then send those off and read the results back and just wo work mostly with, um, within Python. It's really cool. And then I actually talk about PyCUDA in the last lecture. So we have 11 talks. This is the first one. And we have a bunch of, there are a bunch of resources I like. There's Sanders and Ken Drott, CUDA by example. I'm going to work mostly from that book when I do CUDA C stuff. There's a couple of papers I mentioned at the very beginning, the Kirk and Lee papers. Oh, well, no, th no this is actually another CUDA C programming book, sorry. Um, programming Massive Parallel Processors. Um, that's another good reference. Three and four are the papers that I mentioned. And lecture series materials are available um, on the at uh, will-landau.com slash GPU. And you can just go to the page of talks and look for the materials. You can look for the screencast a little bit later. I apologize for being five minutes over, um, but there you have it. That's all for today. Thanks for coming. And I'll pick it up with uh, parallel codeless parallelism next time.